topic of the plenary this morning is the future of development, cooperation, and global health. And uh, we have to, uh, as a background, we have to see that we have to define and discuss the, the post-2015 agenda, the post-millennium development goal agenda. And the year 2015 is approaching and coming closer and closer. So there, in the past few months, there have been several discussions on different levels of the international uh, development community, uh, trying to define new goals for, for this agenda. Uh, the, the problem from our perspective, from the health perspective, is that sometimes you get the impression, or you might get the impression, that the topic of health is more and more marginalized and might not play the role which we think as health professionals it should play. There was even a comment in the Lancet by the chief editor in, in this spring uh, following a conference in Stockholm with uh, nearly the exact topic and uh, trying to define which role health will play in the post-2015 agenda and uh, what will be the specific topics and challenges we have to face. So it's not only, as it was nicely expressed, not only just the what, but also how do we tackle the challenges ahead. I'm very glad that we have two experts uh, here on the panel. I want shortly to introduce them to you. Uh, on my very left is Gerhard Siegfried, he is the department head, East and Southern Africa, of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, SDC. And in his presentation, he will focus on the challenges for a relevant but small actor, SDC, in the global health community. And near to me on my left is Kaspar Wies. He's the deputy head of the Swiss Center for International Health, a department of the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. And he will focus on the history experiences uh, in the past, but also looking, giving some thoughts and uh, based on the reflections to the future of uh, ODA and how to define the agenda for the future. Thank you very much for this uh, short introduction, Axel. Uh, I think, as you said, I will, in my presentation, uh, do two things. First, I will dedicate about half a time available to looking into the past in the last decade, and then uh, talk um, about some possible future scenarios for, uh, for the post-MDG area, so the post-2015 area. Um, this said, I'm not one of these high-level panel members uh, which uh, flies around the world and uh, spends his time um, uh, basically in forays uh, discussing and uh, negotiating the future. I'm an observer of that, so obviously it's not an insider who talks here, but somebody who looks a little bit from the outside on some of the trends what we might see in the, in the coming years. The first slide, um, you don't look at the figures, but look at the lines, and what you see is these lines are showing in different directions. Um, these are different data sources for uh, ODA, so Overseas Development Aid. And by the way, I never understood why this is still called overseas, but maybe, maybe uh, you can explain me, because I think that's somehow the most colonial term uh, still existing in our terminology. But um, it's still called ODA for Health. And uh, what you see are uh, basically the evolution of uh, ODA over the last years and um, by different data sources. And what we see in this graph is there is quite a lot of variation. So meaning many of those data uh, we speak about, about uh, development aid for health, um, there are um, substantial differences. And we'll see later a little bit, and that I will explain, these differences can be in the five to 10 billions, so not small amounts. When we look um, at how the evolution overall of development aid has been, uh, been taking place, we see that it, over the last decade, development aid broadly has tripled. 
we have a little bit outliers in 2005, 2006. Um, that was mainly to major efforts on the side of the IMF and the World Bank in the depth relief, which brought it up. But what we can say, say broadly, development aid has been growing constantly over the last uh, uh, 10 years. Uh, one of the main beneficiaries of that uh, was the health sector. And that's now the um, overseas development health disbursements for health where we see that in about 2010, that's the most recent data, about um, 10, $20 million have been spent for health and development. Um, <clears throat> up from about uh, 4 million. So we have a factor of about an increase of four to 500% in ODA for health. And I think many of us here even in the room have witnessed that when I started about um, uh, 30 years uh, ago, my professional career, a big project was a project with an annual budget or an annual expenditure in the range of one million. Today, I have been, uh, have been work having been in contact with the Global Fund uh, over the last years, I have seen projects of three to five hundred millions. Um, so incredibly much bigger projects. Um, and many of us have seen that what was earlier a big project is today a nitty gritty project. So broadly said, um, health has over the last decade been gaining in importance, um, being representing about 8% of development aid overall in 2002, and uh, going up to about uh, more over 12%. So health uh, as in within ODA, has become more important over the last decade. We have unfortunately, I don't or haven't seen, uh, let's say, more recent uh, uh, figures for 2011 and 2012, but how it looks like um, this tendency has rather not gone the same way. Overall, um, ODA has ha ha haltered and has been remaining more or less stable uh, or even maybe gone slightly down. If you compare that with the water, um, we see uh, uh, substantially more money is allocated uh, for, for health or has been allocated uh, for health than for water in the last decade. Uh, if we look now a little bit closer in where the money goes uh, for the ODA, um, no, first where it comes from, uh, then we see um, there are some major contributors. Obviously, um, the United States and the UK are primary sources which are extremely important for uh, ODA in the health sector. But then also uh, some foundations have emerged. We see here in, in orange how the, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has emerged over the last decade as an important uh, funder for, uh, uh, for uh, global health and for for uh, ODA uh, uh, for developing countries. Um, obviously, this does not mean that the US spends a high proportion measured of its GDP, but just as the GDP is so big of the US, um, this uh, shows us this graph that uh, the US and the UK represent quite uh, nearly half of the, of the uh, health uh, investments uh, globally. If you look then now as a second resource, um, who is funding overseas development health, we see um, that many uh, global health initiatives, specifically in that slide, we see the global health, but also Gavi emerging as important actors over the last decade. So what we can grasp here is the landscape for funding agencies uh, over the last decade has become quite more uh, complex with many new actors appearing over the last decade. And that's only the big ones. Many of us have, in one way or another one, been in contact with all the smaller ones, D&DI, &D uh, uh, you name them. Um, so uh, quite a plethora of new actors uh, mushrooming and emerging over the last decade in the whole uh, ODA for health sector. We must also say um, that many of the ODA, in fact, does not necessarily stay in, in low and middle income countries, but is often closely tied uh, to uh, the country of origin 
on this side, uh, side slide shows that much of the money which is uh, accounted for, for example, by the United States, in fact, uh, principally also remains in the United States and is not effectively going uh, uh, to low and middle income countries. That's obviously also very true for many of the commodities. We will see in one or two slides that the big chunk of the money uh, is going into uh, procurement of drugs, and that's principally money which is either staying in India, but also to an important extent uh, in, in, in the, the country of origin. And many of us are also part of that, and including myself, I must admit. So, um, to what diseases money is allocated? Um, we see that some diseases um, have disprop disproportionately benefited over the last decade. Many of us know that specifically HIV AIDS, malaria, but also TB have been getting substantially more money uh, over the last decade. And um, we'll see in the future um, how this will, will evolve, but definitely um, uh, uh, have been getting substantially more. I think here a decisive character, and that brings me also some uh, for first thought uh, also in looking into the future. I think much of the success of HIV also can be attributed to quite important and, and successful lobbying groups, specifically on civil society level. And I think that's also a lesson maybe for what is newly emerging in terms of mental health, but also NCDs, that part of that success, um, which has been here for, for, for HIV AIDS, is in fact also the success of, of lobby groups and civil society to to, to work in a way uh, and to put some uh, uh, topics on the global agenda. As I said, much of the money, uh, or a, a substantial part of the money which is allocated is going in the purchase of commodities, principally bed nets, uh, uh, drugs, and so on. And um, so, so that's te by tendency, obviously, uh, a, a, a big relevant share of, of, of the money. ODA represents, um, according to countries, quite a different weight in the national budget. So we see here the African countries and how much uh, of the overall health expenditures is given by ODA. And what we see, and I think that's somehow maybe the, the most depressive thing in that figure, is that the poorest countries do not relatively get more. But in fact, that mainly in the, uh, the second lowest category uh, uh, here, there are some countries which very substantially benefit and their uh, ODA for health is a very important um, uh, contributor to the overall national budgets for health. Specifically in the case of Mozambique, but also uh, of uh, Madagascar, where uh, this is a, a very important source. And obviously in equity terms, we would argue these countries at the bottom end, the, 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 the poorest ones, should uh, proportionally get more. We also can look it through the DALI lens. Um, so uh, do those countries with bigger needs get more? And that we see basically that's very uneven allocation. Some uh, countries, in fact, to, are able to absorb or to get much more, uh, let's say, uh, money and that it is often not really the, 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 uh, the equity aspect, but often more political reasons and maybe also historical reasons uh, uh, who determine why some countries uh, are the darlings of the development aid and others are, are somehow uh, left behind. That to say also, this talk is about ODA, but we should not forget that in all of the countries, private expenditure, so what people pay out of pocket is still the main contribute to the overall budgets or overall health expenditure. We should keep that in mind. In many of those countries, between 50 and 80% uh, um, uh, of uh, national health expenditures are, in fact, out-of-pocket pay payment uh, uh, of people. What I'm less clear about, and I must admit I haven't found very clear evidence also going on the literature over the, that how national budgets, is, uh, specifically in Africa, for health have evolved over the last decade. We have been seeing ODA um, has substantially been growing, 
But at the same time, there is, at least what I could found, not very clear evidence how the national budget allocation has been evolving over the last decade. Have we been seeing growth? Have we been seeing subsidies? So basically that some countries did cut down their budget. What we see here, that different countries do allocate of their national budget quite different rates or percentages uh, of their budget to health. And this can be very high, as in the case of Malawi, or extremely low, as in the case uh, of Burundi. Again, and that's by that I end a little bit looking into the past, we should also not forget what we speak about is a really small part of the cake. Still, most of the health expenditures happen in the north, in middle, and specifically in high-income countries. Even if we personally have the impression this 30 millions for ODA for health, or this 20 billions, is a lot. If you look at the global scale, this is even not peanuts. Yeah? Uh, if you look at the global health market, that's uh, basically, you could argue, uh, ne 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 uh, you can't can be neglected. Now, some thoughts about the MDG, so to come to the second part, which will be shorter. Um, the MDGs, I think, as I said already, have been to the benefit of the health sector. Many we know that um, three out of the eight are, um, uh, MDG goals are specifically health-related and others have strong links uh, to health. And um, that obviously has also triggered some of those situations I presented earlier in the sense that ODA for health has substantially uh, improved. And I think here, obviously, a big, a big danger for the future. Um, it's not known how many goals will exist, exist in the future, but it's quite pretty sure that, uh, I call it now the Sustainable Development Goals, how they might be called the post-2015 uh, uh, agenda. If you have one goal on health, I think we can be happy. So that's basically uh, uh, how the situation stands. There is a risk that none of these eight goals uh, is a health related. And obviously, this has substantial risks in terms of ODA, in terms of that uh, less or at the best, the same amount of ODA will be dedicated in the future for, for the health sector. We will see quite a lot on half, half, let's say, have the MDGs achieved what they have been meant to achieve in the coming years? There was already a lot of debate, and I think. In my opinion, you can see that through two lenses. You can see the MDGs have not achieved what they aimed. And here you see the percentage improvement in relation to selected MDGs uh, in the time span 1990 to, two uh, to 2011. Um, and we see basically some uh, have, have really nearly achieved the targets, um, but most haven't. But I think we must also be very careful uh, in not comparing oranges uh, and, and, um, and apples. Uh, um, if we look, let's say the education sector claims that uh, they have been quite um, successful in increasing the enrollment ratio in schools. But what does it mean that? For me, this does not mean very much, honestly said. This doesn't say anything about the quality of schooling. Do people do know today more? Have they learned, have they achieved learning objectives? So for me, this is a little bit a, a too simplistic indicator. It's looking not bad, but it's a simplistic indicator. And how do we compare that with some of the health indicators, which are real outcome indicators? You know, an indicator like ch a reduction in child mortality, that's an outcome indicator. So it's a hard and strong indicator. Um, yes. So. The MDGs have definitely have one thing, and if you again compare it uh, with the 90s beforehand, they have convened the message that health is an in important contributor uh, uh, for development. And I think that, I hope, will stay on the agenda. Um, so prior, it was always seen health is an outcome of development. So as development happens, health outcomes will improve. But M MDGs, and specifically the Commission for Macroeconomics of, on Health, has very strong made, strongly made a point that, in fact, also health 
is the determinant of development. And I think, I hope that this is very much staying in, in the arena. I said already, and don't look here on all the actors, but um, the last decade has made emerging many new actors. And they are likely to remain. I think, let's not hope that these, the number of actors, the number of channels, the number of instruments, the number of pooling mechanisms, you name it, will decrease in the coming decade. We are, can be pretty much sure that the landscape for development aid, and that again, don't go into detail, will remain complex. We can make the guess that some institutions may disappear. Yeah, this may be if the HIV AIDS, TB, malaria uh, is not very high ranked again in the sustainable development goals, then there is an Im imminent and big risk for the Global Fund to have its funding also in the next decade. Others speak already today about having a Global Fund for health systems, having a Global Fund for NCDs. I didn't hear it yet for mental health, but I'm sure also this will be put in the, in, in the, in the public debate. We can be sure these landscapes will remain complex and complicated. I said health is unlikely to be as prominent on the SDP agenda uh, in the future. Where we stand today is basically that the UN has founded 11 UN thematic groups. They have, uh, you see the topics here, health being one among them, but others being uh, uh, also very prominently on the political agenda. They have produced a report. My understanding is that uh, uh, this, uh, in the September, uh, there will be, again, one of these high-level panels, and they will basically start to move towards um, formulating the SDPs uh, uh, for the post-2015 uh, uh, agenda. It's likely that some topics will be high on agenda. Climate change, environment, water, will be most likely very high on the agenda. Uh, also other aspects like population dynamics, migration, um, security is likely to be high on the agenda. Nutrition uh, is be likely on the high agenda in the post-2015 agenda. See others which we would like to have needs to be seen. Determinants of health, many of us would, would argue it's very important that we get that higher on the agenda in the future. We see how this ma happens. I think what we can say already today, how the landscape is evolving, the health sector will need to increasingly look also towards other, other sectors. We'll increasingly need to look towards nutrition, some of the very close sector, but also those where maybe in the past less collaboration has been happening, like climate change, like environment, like water. It looks also like, even if you don't know the goals, the targets, and the indicators of the post-2015 agenda, that some old ones will remain uh, 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 relevant. It looks like, um, the whole MDG 6 about HIV, TB, malaria will remain in one way or another one um, uh, in the agenda. Uh, same for maternal health, family planning is likely to be have a more prominent role. Um, and then um, child health also. I think they all have a big advantage. They offer visibility and quickly uh, wins. We will see with some other aspects on the agenda, they have much more difficulties here to, to, to bring them on the, on the agenda. It looks like that NCDs might play a more prominent uh, um, uh, a role. What is a big challenge in the NCD field in this whole political debate is NCDs has for the moment another very strong civil society lobby. And I mentioned earlier, I think, a big part of the success, for example, for HIV AIDS was that there are a lot of civil society groups uh, who, who lobby. And in the NCD fields, field, we don't find that for, uh, for the moment. Mental health is likely to be also one of those topics be more prominent in the post-2015 agenda. I think here we face the problem that mental health is something extremely diverse. 
ranging basically from alcohol com consumption, substance abuse, up to the classical mental health disorders, schizophrenia, depression, etc. So I think here it will not be easy to find really a good way in public health terms, but also in, in terms of, of, of health systems. What really do we understand by mental health and how do we sell that to a broader public, but also to the policy and the decision makers? Um, health strengthening, many would like to have that. For the moment, it's looking not very good, I think. Maybe some aspects like universal co coverage might be in the post-MDG area. Pro-poor aspects uh, we'll need to see. Some wishes, and then I come slowly to the end. For the moment, it's very clear. All declarations say we would like to have concrete, quantitative, time-bound goals, targets, and associated indicators. But myself, as a more calm person coming from, from the system side, is many of those things are complex. So you cannot easily me measure health system strengthening. We have not really a, a solid a matrix for health system strengthening today, and it's also unlikely that we have simple measures in the near future for, for, for judging on that. Um, so we will need to argue that also more comprehensive and complex aspects are, are getting in, and that not everything shall be at the end be quantitative, time-bound, target-oriented, and easy identified uh, uh, um, uh, uh, indicators. I think this is of, uh, of importance. I think vertical programs had and still have this advantage that they can offer this, and I think that still and will remain one very big s s uh, selling point for them uh, also in, in being on the future uh, or, or on the agenda. So, a last thought, and then I'm, come, I'm at the end, is let's say. We'll see how, it, how the post-MDG uh, agenda evolves, but we must also be clear, one size will not fit all. Yeah. We have today much more diverse situations. Many countries in Central Asia, they have very different disease patterns from African countries or Latin America. So this will need that we, we count also take, uh, take into account this diversity in terms of disease patterns. And maybe, but I'm pretty unoptimistic about that, term, uh, that aspect is about, we will also have countries which will make no progress. And we should be open with that. Let's take some, for me, the, the best example is, let, let's look at a country like, like Haiti. Haiti is now 200 years independent, more than 200 years. If you look where Haiti stands today, not a lot of progress, or hardly any. Huh? There is not a, a more stable, um, uh, government there, there are no more, ca no more capabilities there, and that's true for a number of also auto-fragile countries. I think we will also need to be honest, in these countries there will be uh, a need for transfer payments in terms of ODA, in terms also of us um, being clear about these countries won't get uh, out of their situation in the short run. We will need to think here about 50, 100, maybe even more years. And let's be honest about that. Uh, many of those things will not be addressed in the short run and be fixed in the short run. Yes, substantial progress. We had a, a very big increase in ODA over the last decade. We are also ve very likely that uh, in the post-MDG uh, area, health will not be any longer as pre pre uh, predominant present as it has been in the past. We need to lobby these days, and this is obviously specifically a call for those who are close uh, to the to policymakers, those who can influence uh, who is going on behalf of Switzerland to the UN assemblies, that they are also people with a health background, a health uh, advocacy background uh, in those, those groups so that we have health having at least some place in the post-MDG uh, area. Yes, we will also need to live, continue to live, despite all this Paris Declaration, harmonization talks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the reality will be harmonization will be challenging. There will be a plethora of uh, actors which will remain existent and operating. Sorry for running a little bit over time. I thank you very much for your attention. And um, Gary, I think you're the next one.
nice picture about the global challenges. Now, my part of the uh, intervention would be to show you what does it mean for a small actor as the Swiss Development Corporation. Hmm? Maybe just before I uh, want to welcome you also on behalf of the Swiss Development Corporation, we are very happy being able to sponsor some of the particip participants to that course. So my question would be, how actually would a small actor as the Swiss uh, Development Corporation articulate towards these the challenges drawn out by uh, CASPA? So uh, it is clear that we are not operating in a very free and open space. We are bound as an organization to some uh, corner uh, stones like our mandate we received from the Swiss Parliament. This is a four years mandate the Swiss Development Corporation received from the Parliament. We call it dispatch. We have, and this is a bit special, Switzerland has one thematic foreign policy. This is the Swiss Health Foreign Policy, which is unique in the Swiss administration. And within that Swiss foreign policy, a uh, number of priorities have been set also for our work as a Swiss development corporation. And then, and I really want to underline that, we have to deal with quite a number of uh, Swiss domestic interests. So that we have a political interest to strengthen the Geneva International. Geneva as the health world capital. Huh? We have then some interests coming from the academia and the research, from the pharmaceutical industries, from international and national NGOs, and naturally from hospital physicians and parliamentarians. Now, this is a bit the picture, and uh, I mean, it would be naive to think that these uh, framework conditions are without tensions. Yeah. There are quite some ambiguities between some of these framework, uh, uh, um, uh, framework conditions, and the political processes have then to decide what to do and what not to do. My next slide is a slide you already know. I don't want to go into the details, but just highlight in, in this slide some of the trends which are important in order to position an organization as ours in this global field. What we see, and Casper was mentioning it, we have an exponential growth of uh, actors in health. This exponential growth, I think the good news are there is more money. Maybe the question mark is if we do not have a growing problem of efficiency and uh, effectiveness within the sector. And there I would see a big potential also for the future. The second one is you saw in this, uh, in this uh, diagram that uh, the trend to finance specific diseases has in the last 20, uh, 10 to 15 years grown quite a, lo a lot, yes. The third one you, see, you saw in that slide is that the traditional multilateral aid has lost ground, bilateral aid, foundations, and also a growing NGO sector has come in. Then we have some specific new players, you know them, the gate empires, etc. And at the bottom line of all this, uh, uh, quite uh, uh, an important is discussion is going on about the role of the WHO. Should the WHO continue to be a player, one on the normative side and second on the implementing side, or should this be reviewed in the future? Now, two slides, and I'll not overburden you with that. You can read it yourself, uh, how actually uh, SEC is investing in health. Um, related to what Castro was saying, it's about the 12% of the SEC uh, overall uh, funds are going into health. You see how this is distributed here on the slide. 
And um, we basically are working with the different instruments of the bilateral aid, the multilateral aid, and the humanitarian aid. Here you see the geographical uh, distribution of our aid. So um, it's, you see, uh, health investments are mainly in Africa and in Europe. We do not have any health investments in Latin America and only a few in Asia. The newcomer, um, uh, the new, some newcomers in, in Asia will have in the future some, uh, some, health, uh, some health budget. So the question is, with this 10%, 12% of available budgets, where and how should we spend as a small player, public player in global health? I take here the symbol of the Easter rabbit, bringing colored eggs to the children, to the hidden children eggs, uh, nests uh, in Switzerland. So the question is where to put our eggs? So, now the politicians tell us it is very clear. You, as a public actor, you have to invest where you have Swiss leverage, where we have Swiss visibility that we can show to the public what we have been doing. There, where emerging Swiss business opportunities are, and opportunities in general. Politicians, in general, are not so strategic. They are opportunity-driven, generally speaking. The NGO community tells us, no, 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 no. Don't invest in that. Invest in the grassroots organizations. Invest at the level of the communities. Look really poverty reduction for the, uh, for the, for the individuals, humanitarian aid, etc. The technocrats, Casper, the technocrats say you have to invest in health systems. Yes? Decentralization, public finance management, health financing, basket funding, general budget support. Because when the health systems do not work, I mean, generally speaking, the services are bad. Then comes the researcher communities, also the Swiss researcher communities. They say, please invest in product development and product registration uh, uh, processes. Res uh, uh, invest, generally speaking, in research. Then come the multilaterals. And the multilaterals say, oh, no, uh, please, we want, to have, we want to go to scale. Please invest in global health governance. Please invest in this, uh, in this uh, 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 chain, national, regional, global. And at the end, you have then the Swiss taxpayers. And the Swiss taxpayers tell you, oh, you, SDC, you have to invest in concrete projects. They like the pictures helping mothers and children. They want to see something in the prevention of the global communicable diseases because this is also a danger for the Swiss population. And specifically, they say, don't invest in any risk money because we want to sure that the Swiss franc actually has a result. So, you see, there are really conflicting ideas about what we should be doing. So it is extremely important within this whole field of differing expectations that an organization as ours has set beyond the framework clear priorities. Otherwise, we are just taught each side and everywhere. So what we try to bank on as an organization is on some, we call them comparative advantages. It is said, our external partners say, that SDC is generally 
a reliable partner. When we say we are engaging somewhere, generally speaking, it is for a long time and not just for a one uh, shot. We have a certain advantage beca because we do not have any colonial history. Yes, we try to walk the talk, uh, and then other words like honest broker, context, poverty, and empowerment sensitivity is a kind of, a, of uh, our issues which, uh, or, 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 or are, are things which uh, generally in evaluations are said that the SDC uh, has them. So what we try to do, I think, are three things. In this global health, we try to partner up in a clever way. It is a non-go that SDC as a bilateral actor acts alone. So if we really want to have leverage at the global level, I think partnering up in a clever way is one success factor. Secondly, we try to operate all the times in the micro, meso, macro chain. We want to bring in into the policy dialogue what is really happening on the ground. So, because there is a tendency sometimes that the uh, discussions at global uh, level are quite delinked from the reality in the field. And third, we want to combine all the Swiss foreign policy instruments available, and these are not only the, uh, the uh, instruments of the, of the Swiss development corporations like bilateral, multilateral, etc. But these are policy instruments also. These are uh, peace building instruments, etc., etc. So we try actually in a very systematic way to combine these uh, uh, instruments of the Swiss foreign policy. Now, the picture as it is, and I'm quite honest and critical in terms of where we stand. We have these uh, five clusters, the cluster of neglected tropical diseases, the cluster of health system strengthening, the cluster of sexual and reproductive, uh, reproductive health, and then the cluster of the global health co uh, governance and the determinants of health. The Traffic lights you see here at your right, uh, right hand side uh, indicate a little bit where I feel comfortable and where I, as the responsible for health within SDC, don't feel yet very comfortable. So I think we are pretty good in our partnering up in the cluster um, neglected tropical diseases. We are on our way in terms of the health system strengthening, also for the sexual and reproductive health. I think within, with our involvement in WHO, uh, UNAIDS, and other multilateral institutions, I think we are pretty, pretty, pretty well positioned also in the global health governance. The determinants of health, this is something we really have to work hard where we are not yet there where we want to be. And I put the others a green light. A big challenge, as I have said in our organization, is that the others do not grow, 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 and at the end of the day, we do everything and nothing. So, and I want to end with that. I do not go through all the slides, but just, just to say what would it mean to partner up in a clever way. Here you see the example of our malaria network and actors, where the Swiss TPH is an important partner, where you have the rollback malaria uh, uh, um, as group, where you have the Swiss malaria group, etc. So we try actually to partner up with these with these uh, actors and uh, to, to set common and joint priorities. Here to give you an idea about who is participating in this Swiss Malaria Group. So you see the whole range of partners from the industry up to the NGO scene, up to the research community and, uh, and, and, and others. And um, then I just give you 
And I, I will end with that. I'll just give you one of these uh, networks, the malaria, um, the Medicine for Malaria Venture, one uh, international network developing uh, drugs. So working really from the test phase up to the re registration phase, coming up or in the last years with these uh, new medicaments and the one of the major actual success, as you know, was the pediatric formulation of the Coartem, which was a result of this uh, MMV. And uh, if you look at um, today's portfolio of MMV, so you see there's a lot uh, being done and a lot in the advanced stage already available. So maybe I just end with a last remark related a bit to what uh, Kaspar was saying to the MDG. Yes, we as Swiss Development Corporation have a big stake in this MDG debate. We can maybe afterwards discuss it. We are pretty well, we try to be pretty well positioned, one, through our health implication in the whole political health implication in the MDG debate, but also naturally with our colleagues working in New York. And as you said correctly, uh, in September, the next really moment for, for this debate is then the assembly, which uh, will bring together the first round of work, and uh, we'll see what, uh, what, uh, how th uh, this uh, goes then on. So I will end with that, and I think uh, this gives us a bit time still for discussion. Thank you very much. Gary, also to you, thank you very much for, for this presentation and especially in shortening the presentation so that we have enough time for the discussion. Perhaps to open the discussion, I, I want to address one, uh, one issue. Both of you have shown very clearly uh, the increase in funds over the last decade, uh, the increase in the number of important players in overment, uh, overseas development. Um, and also, I would say at least partly some good success stories uh, of these investments. So the question comes to me and I guess also to, to some of my colleagues, why then health will not be so prominent in the post-2015 agenda. What, what is the reason for that? I mean, it's also very clear, even if we have success, you showed that, Kasper, there will be still uh, a huge field to work uh, in, in health because we will still have uh, many countries uh, suffering. We have inequity uh, in, the, in the health distribution over, over these countries. So is there not enough lobbying in these big meetings, in these high-level meetings, or, or what is it that we must have the fear that health will be marginalized in, in this post-2015 agenda? In, in our view, I think there are two major reasons. One is that health will had a bit an overweight in the last set of MDGs. And the colleagues uh, working more for um, economic development and climate say, but I mean, uh, development is not just social aid. Yeah? So we really have to look that in the future, post MDGs or SDGs, actually, these uh, indicators for business development economic development, but also the whole challenges around climate should be uh, present in a, much more, uh, in a much more clear way in this new framework. So I think, I think at least within our organization and what we had actually uh, in, in, in our international discussions, these were the two main reasons for it. It's obviously difficult to say where to invest. Huh? I think we live in a complex world. Uh, uh, let's say different areas, topical wise areas, are in competition with each other. I think many 
keep working in other areas, in education, uh, in climate change, you name it, they were also a little bit jealous because you could also say uh, it was a big su success um, that uh, for those who working in the health sector, um, that uh, in the MDGs, health was so predominantly, you could even say predominantly, uh, represented. And obviously, they are, uh, let's say, uh, not any longer ready to accept such a situation and, and, and would, would like to have their, uh, let's say, topics uh, 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 more prominent. I think then there is obviously a, a dynamic the world always, and specifically the development aid world needs to reinvent, reinvent itself all 15 to 20 years. And I think, uh, uh, let's say, uh, many of us uh, like to repackage and to resell the old stories under some new names. And for me, for example, the World Bank is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is an extremely good example for that. Uh, about five to 10 years, all that is course was about sector-wide approaches. Uh, Today they have completely left that, they have reinvented them and everything is now about performance-based funding and that within about 10 years. And I think some of these dynamics are the same here uh, for, for, for the post-MDG air, uh, uh -huh. area. And then I think and th this is the important point, it's a political process. So they are, what comes up in the, in the, in, in the post-MDG area is not yet carved in stone. And it's at this stage extremely important that the necessary lobbying is being done. Unfortunately, we have today less people in the driving seat. We have WHO, which is substantially weakened. Um, and so it's not too late, but I hope that at least, I don't know who makes the, uh, the delegation uh, going to, to, to New York. Uh, that we find there also not only the people in the ADA, uh, journalists, uh, which have maybe no clue about health, but also some health advocates in these kind of commissions, because they will, to a certain extent, also determine what will be on the agenda. My name is Isi Sinyampame, and I'm coming from uh, Sweden, from the Swedish uh, National Institute of Public Health. Uh, I would like to thank you both for um, insightful and interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I'm a technocrat and uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, I'm uh, addressing myself to Casper. Uh, I do uh, agree with you uh, with the analysis you've made concerning the future challenges when it comes to uh, global health. But um, I pointed out three, I have some uh, reflection uh, when it comes to what can be done um, in terms of looking um, at um, uh, what uh, the recipients of um, this uh, uh, AIDS um, uh, can do and uh, some of the things that uh, I really liked, uh, I liked uh, uh, in your presentation was the political accountability, uh, which is supposed to be um, a sine qua non uh, condition um, <clears throat> when it comes to uh, make governments to be more responsible. Uh, I don't know what <laughs> maybe you will have more uh, to say about that. And then to, uh, I really like uh, this, um, um, the health, uh, health as uh, human right. And uh, I really uh, like that discussion to look at um, <clears throat> the laws, we, which are very necessary, the rule of law, uh, when we give money, uh, we should um, make sure that uh, money is being used accordingly. Um, what, what can we do to even better line up what we do and uh, I mean what's in these goals with the most current scientific evidence about what drives health on the globe. I'm, I'm 
just seeing uh, of, of your outlines and what I actually read in many reports, uh, if you now go to the global burden of disease as a very good tool to investigate a little bit the evidence, there is a very strong absence of talking about the most important drivers of health and of diseases in the future on the global scale. And that is on one side, smoking. I mean, if you don't take care about that problem, particularly in low-income countries, this will overwhelm in the short and long term their health systems. And the other element I can, of course, mention with my own bias, but it is based on the numbers of the global burden of disease. In many, many countries, air pollution from indoor and outdoor sources is the single most important risk factors that has been established in the global burden of disease. And this is more than 60 low-income countries actually share that feature. And it does not appear, not even as a footnote, in some of these reports that you have cited. The only environmental factor that is sometimes integrated is water and sanitation, which in the global burden of disease ranks far lower than ambient and household air pollution. So what could we do to bring those things on the agenda? I start uh, with uh, the question from my, my colleague. I think there were quite a lot of comments in it. So, But what I understand, the main question was let's say, what is the, the, the main responsibility within that of our African partner countries? Um, I think concretely, and again going to the upcoming UN summit, obviously it will also be them who, who will put their topics on the agenda. They will have an important voice in the UN assembly on what they consider as, as, as important. And they, uh, it's again for us as a health actor, as we, as I said, uh, I hope that in the Swiss delegation some health knowledge and health expertise is in it. I think that's even more important uh, uh, for, for, for uh, countries uh, uh, of the South and the East, that within those delegations there is health uh, also among uh, one of the, of the priority topics, because they have a lot to say. Um, the question about having governments more generally in more responsibility and taking more accountability what they are doing is an extremely challenging one. And I think here we see uh, countries who have done pretty much well over the last decade and others who have not done a mu much. So uh, I give you only a short one, so maybe we can have uh, in the break a little bit more time for following on, up on that. Maybe I, I oh, just can please. add to that. Uh, I, think, I think it's a very important point. Um, Governance, not only in health, but governance in partner countries, I think is a key factor. And if you look at the track record of some of the, uh, of, of the countries, of the darling countries of the international communities, uh, one actually has to put the number of serious questions in terms of why the progresses are so slow. And uh, generally speaking, as it has to do something with, with governance mm -hmm. issues. So, I mean, uh, for us, at least as a small actor, um, uh, we think that in our priority countries, uh, health governance is going to be something which we actually should strengthen and maybe even invest more money. And this does not mean that we are going for health system strengthening but uh, we, we face today a situation where the checks and balances role in these partner countries actually are, is, 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 is uh, fulfilled by mainly the, the bilateral donors. And these checks and balances role should actually be strengthened in terms of a civil society participation in the partner countries, communities participation, etc. And this is the only way where, uh, when uh, health governments actually can improve in this in this country. So I think I really just want to underline for us it's a very uh, a very important topic. And in countries like Mozambique, Tanzania, where we have been investing in, in general budget support, in sectoral budget support, in a lot of health programs. And I mean, the progress is slow, let's be frank. So we have really some serious governance issues there. Coming back to Nino's point, the world is not rational. <laughs> and I think, uh, yeah. Same is here, you know, also we don't invest always in the most cost-efficient uh, uh, interventions. Uh, 
not any, any decision in Switzerland is rational. Uh, there are a lot of things which are irrational. Uh, if I look at the most often cited example, the Oregon model, you know, where all this is done, basically this was afterwards a political uh, process on how the decision were, were taken. Yeah. And I think much of what we talk here is also is about the political process, where some topics are put on the agenda, for example, the NTD area has been extremely successful over the last decade in putting their she stole what you name it topics on the agenda. They have a quite a substantial and very good funding for the moment, but because they have been extremely good in lobby, meaning if you and your colleagues and others um, consider certain topics and you have the BOD data for that, to, to, uh, this has to come high on the agenda. I think that's been the political process. I think the advantage we have some, to, compared to some years ago, the BOD with all its weaknesses and all its critiques and its flaws in data sometimes and in precision is a powerful tool. And I think we see it how many and how often the data set is cited. So it's a powerful tool which can be used uh, to putting some of, of these concerns, smoking, uh, uh, air pollution and so on, putting high on the agenda. Uh, thank you, Nina, for the question. Um, I think I'm pretty optimistic about it in terms of um, um, uh, the whole issue about health determinants is very high on the agenda uh, in the debate on the post-MDG. So, I mean, uh, the question of what, how should we position actually the determinants of health, et cetera, I mean, is very much discussed. This is the first reason. The second reason is that the debate on the um, non-communicable diseases actually is, is growing. And there, all these relations between the factors you said and the non-communicable diseases actually are evident. So I am pretty optimistic that with a sound lobbying work, etc., these uh, two elements will have a will be uh, much higher on the agenda than it was in the past. We as an organization, as I showed you on the slide, uh, determinants of health, yes, we are starting to invest really in that. And it's not only water and sanitation. And uh, so we, we really want to have a kind of a broader picture in it. So I'm, in the long run, quite optimistic that uh, you will gain ground with uh, your remark. Uh, thanks very much. I'm Don DeSavigny from Swiss TPH. Uh, I just want to thank uh, both Casper and, and Gary for these two quite different reflections on the future of ODA in the post-MDG uh, era, uh, one from a global perspective, one from a sort of a Swiss national perspective. I think one thing that hasn't been mentioned, or two things actually, that I think I'd like to hear your reflections on. Um, first, the, uh, the ODA, uh, which maybe it's better called official development assistance and overseas development assistance. If we look at that as it's changing now, the landscape as it's changing now, and what's happening with private financial flows to countries, uh, already, in, if we line that up against ODA, it swamps out. Uh, private investment in countries is much, much bigger than official development assistance. So I'd, I'd be interested to see how that is being understood, uh, followed, reflected, uh, uh, analyzed, uh, governed, etc., because uh, it, will, it will basically dwarf ODA in the future, and it already is starting to dwarf it, but we don't really know what's happening. So that's, that's something, I think, to keep an eye on. Uh, secondly, I wouldn't be so pessimistic that the pace of change has been slow. If we look at population health globally, and in, particularly in the lowest income countries, it has never changed faster in human history as it has in the last five or 10 years. And that's consequent to this huge increase in ramping up of financing and uh, uh, what MDGs have uh, really put in motion. If that is going to continue, um, we are really in the dark about what is actually changing in the levels and pattern of burden of disease. We're basing so much on on model estimates, which are laden with assumptions uh, of how things should be changing. And yet we have no real metrics at the country level. And no one is really investing in helping countries to actually monitor 
the change in population health status, uh, civil registration, vital statistics, surveillance systems, and so on. So as we had seen with PEPFAR and, and Gavi and uh, Global Funds, always this angst about how to measure uh, impact and running around with uh, exercises trying to document uh, impacts, and yet uh, we do not measure cause of death with any quality in low- and middle-income countries. And if we're going to have a post-MDG sustainable development effort, which will focus more on uh, uh, structural and other determinants of health, uh, these changes should even continue to accelerate and, and change in ways we can't quite imagine just now. And we won't know what's happening unless we invest. So somewhere in the wish list should be some serious investment to help countries actually have metrics on population health status. Thank you, Don. Uh, yes, we have here two. Thank you. Thank you to both speakers. I'm Louise Pelzi from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, first, I should say I have changed my question since the discussion period. Uh, why, uh, Gary, are you optimistic and why, Casper, uh, are you so pessimistic about having uh, the prevention and control of NCD in the uh, next MDG uh, goal? Uh, hello, I just uh, want to speak uh, on, the, on behalf of the countries in transition. Uh, I'm from Kyrgyzstan and, uh, uh, for example, in all these perspectives which were reflected so far, I find that uh, in all our countries, uh, through the basket financing or through the parallel financing, the many things was done in terms of the health financing reforms in uh, reaching universal coverage, but um, it wasn't. Uh, in, I mean, in some extent, it was uh, was the uh, mainly with the reaching the coverage of the health by the health services, but uh, nothing about the quality, of course, so far, as you said, about education. Um, so far, we had uh, so many donor organizations who are doing a lot of pilots, coming with a lot of um, ideas, um, uh, models uh, to be implemented, and uh, in some extent, they are pushed. But uh, not all of them are scaled up because it's just a uh, resource consuming and time consuming. And majority of the donors are coming for maximum of three or two years projects which don't reach anything at all. Unfortunately, the World Bank, um, I mean, these kind of organizations like World Bank, who, who should really focus on the uh, scaling up and uh, in increasing the, uh, the coverage or, in, uh, or the extending the models, they usually also are not doing that. And a uh, majority of these uh, banks or uh, systems or financing, they are all uh, absorbed mainly at the central level. And uh, the indicators, of course, they are uh, there, but uh, not necessarily responding to the reality in the regions. And, um, uh, or if to look at the WHO approaches, just an example of SPEP, which, is, uh, which was forced to have in all our countries, but in, in not in all the, almost in 80% of the hospitals, there is no uh, facilities uh, having all the conditions to implement SPEP. So when uh, these people in the regions are coming with the question, how we do all these SPEP techniques if we don't have uh, the pro proper heating or the uh, hot water supply in the maternities, then WHO is just, you know, we don't know. It, it was your government who decided to imply this. So that's, there is a big um, gap between the decisions at the central level and possible implementation at the regional level. And uh, in this regard, I think that uh, the the donor, all these developments should move towards the um, increasing the uh, efficiency and the quality of the services, health services in particular, but through the uh, public finance management reforms in the countries with the focus on the decentralization of the health management and delegating more the uh, responsibility on health um, indicators to the regions and uh, uh, in, this, in this regard, there is an only the question, 
whether these donor um, agencies or the development programs can really be focused on the strengthening the local systems uh, or the local institutions and uh, to establish kind of procedures that they are not closed and they end up when the project is ended. And in particular, uh, this is the question to the uh, whether there is a need to create the parallel structures to implement that or in other projects. Uh, why don't, can we use the local institutions and if they are not, uh, yeah, they don't have enough capacities, maybe first to capacitate them and then give them chance to implement, which will be much more sustainable than it is now. Uh, my name is Katerina and I come from Ukraine, which is a part of ex-Soviet Union. So I have two short ones. Uh, the first one is about uh, SDC. Uh, like if people of Switzerland are informed of the activities of the SDC abroad and do they support it or are they indifferent or they are not informed enough? Do you go public in it? Are they proud of what they do? Because for example, in our country, SDC did a lot of change, especially in perinatal care, maternity, and the people of our country are not so well informed about it. So I'm interested if people of Switzerland are informed where their money go. And the second question is, let's say that you help assist to some country and the governance is not so good in this country, so the changes go slow. Do you have any kind of um, signs of decision making when you say, okay, this is an epic fail and we stop giving money there because it's useless. And what is this point? When do you decide it? Okay. Thank you. First of all, to the question or to the more the yeah. comments of, of Don. Um, yes, I think it's, uh, uh, the landscape has very much changed. The private sector is uh, coming in in a massive way. And uh, we have to be aware, I just want to, to, to add one additional element there. We have also to be aware that uh, new actors are coming in, new public actors are coming in. So the situation for our partner countries has, has changed dramatically, maybe for the good, maybe at least they have, a, they have more options where they really want to, uh, uh, with whom actually they want to run programs. So uh, uh, this has fundamentally changed the landscape. Um, what you were referring to the, uh, to the measurement of, cha of, of, of changes in the health system, I think this is, is very clear. This is a need, uh, but you know yourself how difficult it is, um, how actually then you can really measure the progress in, in the health system. Then uh, regarding the question of the NCDs, um, yes, I'm quite optimistic uh, because I assume that we have quite an important health lobby in this post-MDG uh, agenda at the moment. Uh, but as Kasper said, there is a danger that at the end we maybe might come up with one health, uh, health MDG or SDG uh, and not the, as we had in the past with the three specific. Then to the question of uh, our colleague from uh, Kyrgyzstan, I mean, what you are pointing out, I mean, these are the key features of development cooperation. We face these type of questions all the time. Uh, so our, I mean, uh, our um, ambition then as a donor would be to really uh, enter into a partner dialogue with the local, with the national government, also the local communities in terms of where actually should we place the programs and these programs actually should be negotiated between the population in these countries and the Swiss Development Corporation. So, I mean, but we know the situation. That was one reason why some years ago then everybody was actually running and on on, uh, on a health basket support and general budget support. Just, so I remember when I started in 93 in Tanzania, there were more than 1,000 bilateral projects in Tanzania. And then slowly, 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 we agreed under donors actually to, 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 to put up a kind of a basket funding mechanism because the whole government was just absorbed 
in these thousand projects and uh, with different standards, no scaling up, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I mean, this is a major challenge. What I would say is um, we would expect that government, governments actually take a bit uh, stronger responsibility also in that. And it's not only the donors' governments, it's only also the partner, the partner governments, I think, which have a role in coordinating and in setting priorities. And I think these roles sometimes is a little bit, uh, I would say, vague. And for the last question then, um, uh, yes, uh, we try as much as possible to inform our uh, population about what we are doing with films, brochures, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We also have a kind of a very systematic reporting uh, every four years to the population. The evaluations of our, of our programs are going public. So, I mean, the public has an opportunity to know what we are doing. In general, Swiss population is quite happy about what we are doing. We could, um, in 2012, have a majority in parliaments to even increase our um, budget for ODA or for development cooperation. When you look at our neighboring countries, the trend is more at the decrease. So I think we have still, we have the support, but we have actually really to maintain also the, the contact with the population. Um, and, and the second one was this uh, decision making when governments was, uh, was questionable, no, uh, SDC is quite a reliable partner. We are investing in health in Somalia, which is a failed state, in Haiti, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, I mean, our, our uh, ambition is to go step by step with our partners and uh, we do not stop after three, four years when the situation, we do not have any political conditionality, generally speaking. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, coming back to Don, you know, honestly said, I'm not so much concerned about the, the metrics point. I'm much more concerned that for some topics which are the, at my heart, it's very difficult to have a metrics and it's very difficult to sell them. Health systems, I mentioned it also, but also other aspects, you know, Governance, you don't have really a metrics for governance. How would you like really to measure that? The, uh, and, and we will have a lot of pressure, you know, to, to have in the post-MDG area, again, very goals, very clear targets, very clear indicators. And I'm much more concerned about that point, that things which we, most I, I would argue here in, and including myself, um, let's say, are, are really uh, considered as extremely important, but tend to be neglected because we don't have the, the, the metrics at all. And, and so mm -hmm. your point is that, that the metrics for some of the things is, is, is a very weak quality. I'm, I'm, I'm less concerned about that. I'm, I'm much more concerned that we have really ways on, on seeing governance and also to say uh, how we, 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 we progress, for example, with health governance. Mm -hmm. um, entities. I, I'm, Maybe that was a little bit wrong. I'm not fully pessimistic about NCDs and, 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 uh, and uh, 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 the future. I think 2011 was definitely a marking year for NCDs with the whole UN summit, uh, a big achievement. But at the same time, there is, is competition, as I was mentioning. And, and here I'm less sure how well NCDs can position themselves. NCDs will be in strong competition to the classical vertical disease uh, 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 programs which have a lot of knowledge how to do these things. Uh, uh, HIV, to repeat it, I think they, n they know how to put them on the agenda. They have been extremely successful and they are likely to be continuously successful to put them on, on the agenda. So here I'm, I'm, I'm less sure about the NCDs, how, uh, let's say, easy it will be also to, to sell a whole package because NCDs oh. is, a, is a broad area. It's not one single thing. It's a, you mentioned some, and there is many others which, uh, which we didn't touch on. The comment from Kyrgyzstan, yes, I agree with all what you said about uh, uh, looking for decentralization, in investing in local structures and so on, but this requires also ca capability of the counterpart. And just Central Asia, many countries, we don't see a, a tremendous increase in how things have 
uh, let's say, improved over the last 20, 30 years. Uh, Kyrgyzstan has gone forth and back, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, I think SDC would be the first to be ready to invest in, in really in, in, in capable governments and to let them administer uh, uh, the, 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 the money themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much, and thank you, the audience, uh, for participating here. What I learned here is what Don said, but also many others. <clears throat> we should not be so pessimistic uh, in, uh, for the future. We know that there are a lot of challenges, and perhaps, uh, but, but not just sitting here and say, okay, let's see and wait. We should use our optimism, hopefully all of you have, and brief and convince those who are in the driving seat. So, so as Kasper said, really trying to get as health professionals influence to the decision makers and convince them that health, I, I like this expression very much, is not only a, an outcome but also a contributor to, to development. And in that sense, I wish you the best for today and for the whole week uh, for part your participation in the course. Thank you.